Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship at Christmas <laughs> Lutheran. Today is we are so we are observing the second Sunday in Lent, and I guess it's a privilege. It was like old home week picking out hymns for this Sunday. So you're going to find two of them that I sang in my childhood. So some of you probably did as well. So I hope you enjoy them. They're part of our service. I will begin with hymn 502, Children of the Heavenly Father. Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord by singing him 583 verses 1, 3, and 4. Jesus, my Savior, himself did wrong. 
see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us, both outwardly and inwardly, from all adversities that may happen to our bodies, and from all evil thoughts which may attack and harm our souls. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from Job chapter 1. I think a little bit of background to this reading would help us understand it. Um, so Satan recognized Job was one of the wealthiest, most wealthy men in the world of his day. And he went to he went to God and God pointed him out and Satan said to God, well, the only reason he believes in you is because you've blessed him so much. If he wouldn't be that blessed, he wouldn't believe. And, and God was like, okay, you can test him, but you cannot take his life. So this is um, Satan and, in a sense, the Lord testing his faith, and we will see how Job was triumphant uh, over these temptations. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 22, and you will recognize this as foretelling um, many of the things that Jesus had to suffer while on the cross. And we'll read it responsibly. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? I am the Lord, and I am for All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. All my bones are on display. You lay me in the dust of death. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength, come quickly to help me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, 
because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, <coughs> and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we not have now received reconciliation. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We invite our children to come forward for the children's room. So, do any of you have puppies? Yeah. Yeah. I have two puppies, Lucky. and they have they have a bunch of toys that that they play with, and so every night the toys are put in a pile, and through the day, one by one, they sort of get carried off all over the place, and what happens is. They, both my wife and I have a little problem with our walking. And you know what it's like to step on a, on a puppy bone? <laughs> it can send us off balance pretty bad. That's not a good thing. But then it's time to clean it all up and put them back in the pile so we don't trip over them like at night. So we have to do that. And even that's sort of hard because we have to bend over and put them in a pile. So what happens is, is that's sort of a burden for whichever my wife or I have to do to get those things out of the way so we don't trip on them. We might call it a burden. Okay? So your mom and dad have burdens in their life, and sometimes they're pretty big ones, and they have to do things, and it puts a lot of pressure on them, and we might even call it they have a weight on their shoulder. It's a burden. Um, so Jesus talks today about a cross, that we have to carry, and, you, and all of us have a cross that we have to carry, but sometimes we can be a help, and I'm thinking of something my mom always tried to get me to do, and that's clean my room, or clean up my toys that I put in the living room so she wouldn't have to. And if I did it, it made her life a little easier so she didn't have that heavy weight on her shoulder. Okay? Um, we could say the same about in the yard. My dad would have to mow, and we'd have toys around. And they'd say, go, go get your toys. Okay? Pick them up so I can mow. And so what happened if I didn't do it? Yeah? I'd be in pieces. <laughs> yeah, if you ran him over. <laughs> or I made his life a little more miserable. He'd have to go and get it out of the way. Like if there was a bike on the grass, guess who had to do it then? My dad. And boy, if he had to do it, mm-mm. <laughs> But, you know, some, some, God asks us to consider 
our actions, I've been there. No, I've been there. I've been a kid, I've been there. Um, they ask us to do things that we don't necessarily really want to do. We have better things that we'd like to do. But that's where God asks us to, today God is asking us to carry our cross. So I was trying to think of how kids would carry their cross. And sometimes that's just doing what our parents would like us to do, to do the chores or little things that, that they need so that we can help them out to make their life a little easier. So I, as, you, as you hear carry your cross today, I would say help your parents out. Help them, that are, them with their crosses so that it isn't quite so heavy on their shoulders. Because when they ask you to do something, you're being helped to them, okay? So here, I'll let you go ahead and grab a little something and head back to your seats. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> So our gospel is from Mark chapter 8, and um, in this, just before, just before these words, um, Jesus asked the question to his disciples, who do people say I am? And Peter's answer, just two verses before this, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those were his words, his confession, okay? He then... He, Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angel. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with hymn 702, Come Follow Me in the Savior's Faith.
be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration was our gospel lesson for this morning from Mark chapter 8. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, well, some of us oldsters have sort of stuck to our ways, our habits from days gone by, and so in some ways we've gotten with the system. I'm not sure how many of you have dictionaries in your home, but I don't use mine anymore. I put it on Google. So when you look up a word to find out its meaning, sometimes you get more than one meaning. Let's use the word sweet. We might say, that cookie is way too sweet for me. That's not me though. I like that cookie. Or we might say to a parent, like those of, of two of uh, the ones that came up to the front today, your little girl is so sweet. Two totally different meanings, right? The word flat could be used to describe a singer. I remember being in choir in the high school and our director would, we would be doing a piece to go out and sing it in churches. We'd be doing it a cappella and we'd start out the song and we got to the end of it and then he'd play the note and uh oh, we were really flat. So we were off key. Or, on the other hand, we might tease someone about being a flatlander. <laughs> someone from Illinois. I, I've driven that route to the south of Rockford. I don't know if you see a hill for 100 miles. <laughs> flat. Flat as a pancake is a line that people say once in a while. Today we're going to study two crosses in our lives. Jesus' cross and our own cross. And we will see that we shouldn't put either one down. Now someone might say, wait a minute, I'm not carrying Jesus' cross. So how can I put it down? Well, as I mentioned, there can be more than one definition to a phrase. When I was in high school, I don't know if they do that anymore, but when I was in high school, to put someone down meant to criticize them, to degrade them or their reputation. In that sense, Peter put Jesus' cross down. When Jesus informed his disciples that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again, we are told that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Peter put Jesus down. He put Jesus' cross down, and he criticized him for talking this way about suffering and dying. In a sense, that's like a normal person. I watch a lot of crime and action TV shows and movies and read a little bit of that kind of novel. I find that when the character I like I even care about him, him or her, because I've watched a bunch of shows. If they get captured and then tortured, I cringe a little bit inside. And even though it makes for a better story, I don't like to see that happen to them. And there's a feeling deep down inside, most if not all of us, feels that way about Jesus suffering and death, right? We wish that Jesus wouldn't have had to do that 
and we wish that he would have put the Jews and their Romans in their places, giving them what they truly deserved. But we must be careful not to put Jesus' cross down. Yes, it goes against the world's idea of strength and power and conquest, but it was with this cross of weakness and shame that he did conquer sin, death, and the devil. He became the sacrifice for all the sins that anyone had committed or would commit. And he was the sacrifice for our sins, paying for our sins with his life. Now there are people who put Jesus down by not believing what I just told you, or who even speak against it. There are many who call themselves Christian, who are what we call in pastoral circles, universalists, who don't believe in hell because a loving God would never send anyone to a place of suffering like that. So we call them universalists because everyone gets to heaven. Everyone gets eternity with God. A belief with, of this type would put down God's word about sin, like where in Exodus God says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous, jealous God, punishing the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Or it would be putting down Paul's words in the book of Romans where he says the wages of sin is death. So when someone makes sin trivial, when someone makes it as though sin, eh, it's no big deal. Everybody sins. God isn't going to punish people for it, because that's the way they are. If they do that, they put down Jesus' payment for sin, like the one mentioned in 1 John 1. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Or the description of the people in heaven in Revelation 7, where those in heaven have washed their robes dirty with sin and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Or Paul's words in Ephesians, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now I realize it's a terrible picture to have in our minds to think of Jesus. I don't know how many of you that many years ago when the movie came out, The Passion of the Christ, we took a bunch of us from church and we went to see it in the movie theater. It was so graphic, it sort of tore you apart inside to see and you could easily put Jesus, our Savior, into the role of that movie, of that actor. To see God's Son tortured, nailed to a cross, and see him so bloody and bruised and weak. I have to admit I had tears in my eyes because my faith was at work, realizing that it was my sins also that caused that to happen to me. But dear friends, you and I would have to spend eternally in hell if he had not done this. So please don't put Jesus down. If you are tempted to not want to hear the story of Jesus suffering and death because it's too gory for you to imagine, stop feeling that way because that's how you and I were forgiven and are saved. And it was for that reason that Peter, or Jesus rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Peter wasn't thinking about paying for the sins 
of the world. He was thinking about conquest of the Romans. He was totally off base. Anyone who would put down Jesus' cross or criticize Jesus for going to the cross is acting as a servant of Satan himself. As I, be, as I mentioned before, there is a second cross in our lives, and we don't want to put that one down either. And that's our own cross. And here I use the phrase put down in the sense of discarding it. Now over where I was pastor for 32 years, there's a little Amish store called Bendut. I love going there. I was just there this past week. And sometimes, like if you happen to find a bottle of Tide there, or maybe two or three, and you don't get nice bags that you carry out of a grocery store. You get a banana box when you go to bed then. You get a box like this, and like this, and like this. And believe me, when you have anything liquid in it, that is a burden. And like in my house, if you got to go, I got to go up six stairs from my car and you know my balance issues to get that box up those stairs into the house get the door open get it shut real quick so the cats don't get out and get the box around the corner around and onto the onto the kitchen counter i'm white <laughs> i want that burden done and so i get, put the groceries away and get it put away and I take that box and chuck it down the stairs and I'll deal, deal with you later. <laughs> so I'm, I'm tired from the effort. Jesus said in the second half of our gospel reading, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So what is that cross that Jesus is talking about? It is any suffering or shame that might come our way as a result of being a believer in Jesus Christ. That is a cross, Jesus says, that we must not put down no matter the weight. Okay? When Jesus says that we must deny ourselves, that's where pastors knowing the Greek language helps a little bit. There's a specific way that the word is said, and we call it the imperative, and it means it prohibits the action. So he must deny himself, a command that gives us no options. He must deny himself and take up our cross and follow him. Now this can be misunderstood or even over applied what Jesus is saying to us. I'll use the over applied here real quick. During Lent or maybe even for the rest of their lives some people will deny themselves something they enjoy or like. Okay. This is not what Jesus is talking about. It's nowhere near what Jesus is talking about. Because what's at the heart of it is trying to show ourselves worthy of God's love. Or maybe we're even trying to get some forgiveness for our sins. That's over applying because Jesus paid for our sins on the cross with his life. It might make us feel better inside, but that's not really that worthy of denying ourselves. Luther once spoke about that. And he, he said, okay, if you want to fast, it's a fine outward custom, 
But if you want to come to communion and be worthy, believe. Believe that Jesus gave his body, shed his blood for you. That's what really matters. There are other crosses that the Lord wants us to carry during our lives. Sometimes those crosses are made to bring us closer to him. Maybe so that we aren't so self-sufficient. Um, when you have physical weakness and maybe even have some things taken away from you physically, we aren't so self-sufficient. And those things, those burdens, those crosses help us look forward to our eternal home where there will be no more suffering. Sometimes crosses will bring glory to him because they give us a chance to show our family, our friends, to the world around us, our faith in Jesus because we're not going to quit that faith because of something that has happened to us. Life has become much more difficult, but we're going to remain firm in God despite that. We sort of saw that in Job this morning. I don't care what all has happened, my faith in the Lord remains firm and strong. We're going to be cheerful in adversity because we have God's promise of the future in our minds. So whatever its purpose, where the Lord hands us a cross, let's not put it down for any reason. We don't want to run away from it like Jonah who ran away from his cross. He headed the other direction from where God wanted him to go. It's wrong because it's the Lord who gave us that cross. And if we're called on to take some flack for our Christian faith or Christian principle, that is our cross as well. We must not put it down. Other crosses we must not put down. Maybe we're overloaded with responsibilities. I can give you one of those times. Being a pastor at a church and giving them all that I can and then having seven and a half years of taking care of my aunt who had Alzheimer's. Okay? That's a burden. That's something that the Lord, a cross that the Lord placed on me. There was no one else who could really do it. Okay? Sometimes our spouses, children, grandchildren, parents, life can be difficult for us. But God gave them to us. We don't want to not to, to stop talking with them. Don't give up on trying to teach them the right thing. Keep showing them love as God showed us his love when we sinned, when we fell away. There's another one. I don't know how deep to go into it. <laughs> I thought of at least five different things this morning driving down here. People have stopped coming to worship or have stopped being active in the church because of someone in the church. <coughs> Boy, you want to talk about how Satan tempts. I'll give you one example. I know a lady in her 30s, she played, this is many years ago, played organ for church. And one person dared to come up to her after church and say, you're playing too loud. She quit, never played organ for a church service again. And who was behind that? Not the lady, Satan. Satan knew exactly which button to push to get up us, to get her to take up her cross and quit. You know, doing this, doing something like that, 
is to put down our cross. So please never consider not worshiping or working for the Lord because of it. Carry it for God's glory, for his church. You and I could come up with many, many more things that the Lord could call on us to hang in there and not run away from the crosses that he would command us to carry and not put down. He said, Forever, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me in the gospel will save it. Very interesting words there. And Jesus really puts it on the line about living selfishly for this life or for him and our life in eternity when he says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? <coughs> Would any reasonable person argue with our Lord Jesus here? Yet many people do exactly this with their lives. And you and I, we're tempted to do the same. I can't tell you how many times in life that that temptation to not want to do something because of something else, somebody's words or somebody's actions, those temptations are there. And, but Jesus' reasoning stands. Why, so we go back, why would any sane person jeopardize their eternity for a little bit of pleasure or to avoid a little bit of suffering or an uncomfortable situation? Why would anyone put down their cross when we're just asked it to, ver to bear it for a very short time compared to eternity? And you and I know why we're tempted, because our sinful flesh likes to live for the moment. Our emotions, our sinful pride likes to get the better of us. We make decisions quickly, and frankly, our sinful flesh is extremely selfish. We ask, so what will make my life easier, my life less, less complicated, my life less stressful? And we don't ask, God, what would you have me do for you and for your kingdom? Dear friends, we have a home in heaven awaiting us, a privilege that will only happen because Jesus carried his cross. Think of that day whenever temptation comes, and let's not put down that cross, either Jesus' cross or ours. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us confess our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, you forever, have forever shown your love for us sinners, because when we were powerless to save ourselves, you had Jesus die in our place. Forgive us our sins for the sake of his blood that was shed, and spare us. Dear precious Savior, you went the awful way of the cross because of your father, love for the Father and for us. We know that your way was made more bearable because of the Father's promise to exalt you in heaven. Ease our load of suffering and sorrow by virtue of the love you have for us and the hope 
of glory that you have given us. As you were glad to obey the will of your Father in order to save us from our sins, may we also be filled with the spirit of loving obedience that always delights in doing his will. Teach us to know our needs and shortcomings that we may always pray to the Father in your name for every needed blessing. Teach us to recognize our sins so that we will daily confess them and find forgiveness. Teach us your new commandment so that we may learn to love one another as you have loved us. Spirit of God, apply to all of our sins the precious shed blood of Jesus that we may have perfect cleansing and be found acceptable to our Father in heaven. Keep our faith from failing. We ask all these things in the name of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We continue with the next hymn. <coughs> Thank you. 
we pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptations, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude with our final hymn. pastor and we certainly ask the blessing and guidance of the Holy Spirit um, to be with our choice and to help the pastor that we call deliberated. Um, we also have our Lenten service this Wednesday at 6.30. Um, the, uh, the theme is the sword and the severed ear, so it's definitely talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane while he was in the process of being arrested. <laughs>